All right, the story begins on a cold, rainy Sunday afternoon in February of 2000, when as a new arrival to the Bay Area, I was invited by a friend and colleague to attend an exhibition in the Rivera Gallery at the San Francisco Art Institute on Russian Hill. As unassuming, charming, and impressive as Bakewell and Brown's, Erzat's Spanish Mission Entry Court, and Diego Rivera's 1931, the making of a mural showing the building of a city are, neither prepared me for what followed. Moving through a modest opening at the back of the court, one is startled to have arrived on what appears to be a vast public terrace surrounded by 250 degree panoramic views of San Francisco Bay, Coit Tower and the North End, but eventually realizing one is in fact atop a building beneath your feet a remarkable and inspiring and not unsly extension of the public realm where one would least expect it. Won in a competition and completed in 1969, and despite having weathered multiple administrations, competing agendas and functional demands, as well as the ravages of the marine environment, the terrace retains its essential and at moments arresting Dekirikan essence, defiantly embodying modernism's core utopian mission in an environment which has since become even more famously resistant to it. This nearly accidental stroll in 2000 <clears throat> culminated in a monograph six years later and multiple returns of the, <clears throat> of the migrating bird, which brought Pafford Keating Clay back to the Bay Area to receive awards at the Monterey Design Conference, to lecture at the Art Institute and attend the school's gala in 2017, where he spoke to the students in an auditorium he designed 48 years earlier. Pafford and I first met in person in New York in the spring of 2003 on what was one of his first returns to the United States since leaving for Vancouver in 1975. It took a year to track down a man living in a farmhouse in Spain without a phone, electricity, or running water, but as the bin Laden unit of the CIA can attest, anything is possible if you keep at it long enough. Visiting Christo's drawings of the Gates project exhibited at the Met foreshadowed a second visit years later when the project was completed. During these visits, he discussed in detail his time in, the Paris, in Paris working in Le Corbusier's studio and visits with Brancusi in his studio. Born in Tiffant, England near Stonehenge, Pafford found himself in Le Corbusier's office, thanks in part to his father-in-law Siegfried Gideon, another of modernism's Swiss evangelists. While there, he spent the majority of his time working on the concrete formwork drawings for the first Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, specifically the monumental sculptural piloti at the ground level. This extensive in-depth knowledge of formwork detailing would be put to use in the next chapter of his career in the United States, working initially in Spring Green and subsequently in Scottsdale, as was the tradition. Pafford was part of Frank Lloyd Wright's studio for just over a year and seen here cuts the portrait of a young architect on a desert campaign. His time with the fellowship was spent applying his Marseille experiences to the design and detailing of the Johnson Wax to Research Tower, completed in 1936. Closed to public access for decades, the structure is characterized by its alternating full and cantilevered concrete mezzanine lab floors. Lessons were learned and modes of practice absorbed, perhaps osmotically, which would inform this architect's future practice. Joined by his now wife, Verena Gideon, Siegfried's daughter, Pafford departs his time with the fellowship to strike out on his own and immediately stakes a land claim on a parcel in the Arizona desert under the 1848 Homestead Act. Here he builds his first work of individual architecture, the Wallace Desert Pavilion, a concrete slab, four posts, and a broad overhanging roof providing shade with a table and two benches. His next house, the Tamalpais Pavilion, continues all of the themes initiated in the Desert Pavilion now in post-tension concrete built atop Mount Tamalpais in Marin County in 1971. Not unlike many of modern architecture's lesser known gems, the house still exists, albeit in subsequently altered form, having been continuously owned by Sammy Hagar, who bought the pavilion from Pafford in 1975 and has expanded it in response to his changing needs over the time. One longs for the unwinding of these changes and the restoration of its orthodox and notably still railingless elemental simplicity. Pafford Keating Clay Architects produced perhaps a dozen built projects during the approximately five years of its existence. Almost all of these projects still exist today, although several have been significantly altered in ways only a fourth tier commercial real estate broker could love. 
All of these projects have ideas. None were throwaway bread and butter buildings. The role of geometry and the rigor of structure combined to point Pafford in a new direction towards the end of his practice. Informed by some of the later Usonian works which were ongoing in the Wright studio of the period when house designs were generated from all the geometries, squares, rectangles, hexagons, diamonds, triangles, they took all comers. Following Moshi Softy's dismissal from the San Francisco State Student Union Commission he had won in 1968, Pafford subsequently received the commission, producing a design which synthesized Wrightian plan motifs with Corbusian massing in a work that pointed towards a new second generation strain of synthetic modernism. The base of the structure is supported by a precast diagrid, which supports an overhead roof structure designed in part to extend the experience of the campus landscape and its made main quadrangle vertically into the sky. From this plinth emerged two monumental inclined and truncated pyramids, one of silence containing the library and stacks, the other of sound supporting an amphitheater and gathering space atop its roof. The dynamic interplay of these two forms is the extension of the Art Institute roof writ large. The building cannot be accused of modesty. Arriving at the tail end of the protest movement surrounding the Vietnam War and the ascendancy of postmodernism in the Second Bay Area School, architecture and culture, especially in San Francisco, had moved towards a softer, more nostalgic and less confrontational trajectory. This would be Pafford's last architectural project. His Fisherman's Wharf studio was closed prior to the completion of this building and he subsequently moved to Canada. Continuing his work as a sculptor, author, and artist, Pafford collaborates with engineers and fabricators in Germany and is supported in part by a European patron who commissions him to install works on his portfolio of properties throughout the United States and Europe. Pafford continues to write, having recently completed an unpublished autobiography of his life and architecture entitled Modestly, The Odyssey. If there are any interested publishers out there in the audience tonight, it's totally available. Netflix, call me.